technical department lectures. Um, tonight we've got um, a landscape architect who's going to talk about uh, a number of projects from the very small to the very large and uh, from the very serious to the very unserious. Um, he's an architect who trained at uh, Manchester as a landscape architect and uh, has been in practice for about 15 years, most of which has been with uh, Derek Lovejoy, who are one of the larger practices in England, who are, I think he tells me, are practicing in nearly every country in the world just now. Anyway, uh, I'll introduce uh, Clive McDonnell. Hi, everyone. Th thanks very much for coming along. It's, uh, you've been given a brief introduction to me. My name is Clive McDonnell. I've been with the Lovejoy practice for about 14 years now. Just a little bit on the practice, and let's see if we can get this to work without things going wrong, because if things are going to go wrong, they're going to go wrong with the projector, aren't they? It'll be this one, I think. Yes, here we are. This is going to focus itself, I think. Yeah. That logo costs a lot of money on the right, but I won't tell you how much, and it's probably been more debate about our company logo about six years ago um, than any other thing we've ever done in our lives. Um, but it's meant to represent solidity, the main elements of hard landscape, soft landscape, and water, and it's meant to be an adaptable and lasting logo, so hopefully we're here to stay. We have been around for 25 years, and historically, I think, we're, we're probably one of the best-known practices in the world. Um, Derek Lovejoy is still alive and rather like a second-hand car dealer. He looks like one and sounds like one. He floats in to see us every so often, uses our phone for copiously long periods of time, says goodbye, mate, and off he goes. So, wonderful chat, but uh, he's sort of established a good name in the industry. We have four offices in England, um, Manchester, Edinburgh, Leicester, and London, where I'm based. Um, I think our total staff number is about 85 now. <coughs> We've probably been up at our peak to about 125, and the London office has about 30 people in it. I think the nice thing about the practice, uh, and the profession indeed, is that it's about 50-50 split of boys and girls, um, which I think is quite unusual. And I say boys and girls because I'm quite proud to say I think the average age of the people in, in, in my office is about 25, so I think that gives you an indication we're a young and vibrant office. 50-50 men, female, and one or two in between is who are charming. I think the most important thing, I mean, I, I really do think we're a people industry, and I think one of the nice things about, about our office is we have, we have a, good, a good bunch of lively people that are not frightened to go out and speak and have a bit of fun. And one of the most enjoyable, um, if I could term it, frivolous projects that we've been involved in was the the planning and the landscape design of the Disney Park in Paris. Um, I put this slide on first because it shows a whole lot of people, and I did say we're a people practice, so there we are. That's Mickey on the right. He actually lives in Florida, but one of the nice aspects of working on the Disney Park was the first thing we had to do was go out to Florida for two weeks and see how they, how they do things. And this little chap was in the Disney Hotel um, in Florida, and I thought he was quite a nice introdu introduction, quite a nice light-hearted chat. The left-hand side is the site master plan. It's a 50-hectare site. It's part of a land holding of 1,900 hectares that Disney have bought up over a long period of time um, on, in the North French Plain. It's about 30 km kilometers east of Paris, and in fact, I believe their land holding is about one-twelfth the size of the whole of Paris. So when you hear these sort of local French nationalists getting nervous, it's not just about the park, it's about the extent of ownership that the Americans have now got on sugar beet fields in the North French Plain. We, are, as landscape architects, the Americans have bloody good landscape architects. They didn't come to English people to help them with everything. The element they didn't understand was how to create the different effects they needed within the park with plant material to theme the actual different divisions of the, of the actual park. Um, the main thing is they didn't understand what vegetation would survive in the very hostile conditions of the North French Plain. And worst of all, because they wanted to imitate tropical jungles, and so we're trying to stretch the limits of the use of plant material here. Also, the soil was um, 
was really very, very poor. It was like MacDougall's flower. It used to blow away in the wind, had no structure, and was very alkaline, um, which doesn't always help you when you're trying to um, grow a wide cross-section of plant. It, I suppose most have, have many people been to the parks in the Disney parks and know the way they're divided into lands and so on. There are five, four main lands, and I never know what they are, but I'll have a stab at it. One's of the sort of, um, this thing's quite good, and I've just got to get it the right way around. This lake here, this area here is kind of the Americas, and it's the, it ranges from Colorado around to Utah into, into the drier, drier areas of America. This area here is the Pirates of the Caribbean. This is a tropical area, so this is a tropical landscape in the North French Plain. This is fantasy land designed for kids, lots of roundabouts with teacups and things like that, with a wonderful castle sitting there. And this is kind of Jules Verne's view of the future, Discovery Land, where we're projected into the future, rocket rides and all that sort of thing. The hub is where you choose where you're going to go. I'm going to use this. This is brilliant. I want one of these. Main Street is this thing here. I, I don't want to frighten people out in the streets. Imagine. Me. <laughs> Main Street is here, and the entry forecourt is here. We did everything within that zone with, this, with the soiling, planting, and grading. This is sort of, um, a bit on the right, it's just a little bit of um, glamour for you, but on the left is the castle under construction. And you can see, you can actually see there that, that, that rather grotty looking soil, very white and powdery. Um, but this is, shot's an illegal shot, which makes it more exciting because you weren't meant to take photographs um, when the park, park was under construction. Loads of guys with jackboots and, and very sexy sort of beige sort of one-piece suits, but they couldn't stop me taking photographs. It was wonderful. This is, a, on the right, is a model of the whole resort, and actually the, the, the park is in the, the right-hand side, it's the top part of the, the um, transparency. That's the entry forecourt with the five-star hotel designed by Watton G, Wimberley, Allison, Tom and Goo, who have an office um, near Sloan Square. And all this is a really the resort um, and hotel area with the various hotels and a huge lake. We are currently, and have just been commissioned to look at this area here, where we're, we're putting down this side of the street, this derelict land here, and we're extending the Disney Village. And this land here, we're turning, we hope to, be turning into like a, do people know Ansel Adams, the American photographer? Um, he does a lot of photographs of Yosemite National Park. We're calling this a wilderness park. There are gonna be thousands of grazing animals down on this plain that will be made of wood and some sp very modern glass buildings, four of them in the background, sitting amongst huge rocks and pine forests. Um, and they're, they're going to be made of glass and going to be full of light. And it, it's really going to be going to be a wonderful extension to the whole experience. This is a tree being made. So not all the trees on the park are real. Um, that's a huge tree where, it's where uh, um, who's the guy that lived up the tree? Some, one of the Disney characters, I don't know. Important on the, on the, um, the left-hand slide to let the Americans know what we're trying to create for them because, frankly, they didn't know what to expect. And the sort of perspective sketches that we did and cro cross-sections and so on at the top enabled Disney to see the sort of landscape we were going to create for them. This is actually a car ride called Utopia where you get in a little car and you go bombing around this track. It's on a rail, actually. And they wanted you to experience the leaving of a town, going into suburbia, um, going in it through the agricultural lands, and then into the deep forest, and then back again. And so within one small area, that's actually the ride there, we had to kind of theme a whole load of landscapes in a kind of mock way. This one here was really the sort of the height of Urbania, but, you know, getting into the future with space, space age trees and clip forms and round balls on slopes and square balls on the tops and you name it, they were there and they loved it. And that was just the end of it anyway. Um, very important, um, you know, this again is conveying information to the, to, this was for Disney, not, not as contract drawings. This was to show them where we were coming from, what we were doing with the tree layer, the shrub layer, how we were forcing perspective by, you see these shapes here? Had to make the thing look bigger than it really was. So these are false perspectives with plants here. And uh, I think there are some chevrons and stuff here that was like a racetrack start and all that sort of stuff with plants. Great fun area to work on, actually. 
And Disney are brilliant at building rocks. I mean, when they, they actually occupied um, a very large portion of an industrial estate just outside Paris. And they had an area, it would have been six times the size of this room, devoted to rocks. And what they do is actually they build these at a tiny scale, like the size of this table, and then section them up with a knife, or more technically than that, I guess. And then they build them the next scale, then they build them the next scale, until they've got a pretty, pretty large replica of the rock feature they're going to build. And once they're satisfied, all the joints look right, and they know exactly how they're going to divide it for construction, they go out and build these rock features. And they are fantastic, because um, I'm a good guy at spotting a fake. And you really, if you're uptight against that, it's very difficult to know that this rock work isn't real. It's quite, e quite extraordinary. Basically, it's a, it's a wire frame um, with concrete gunited or sprayed onto it. And then they do lots of interesting work with silver paper folded up to create fissures and cracks. And they pull it out at the silver paper out at a certain time of the concrete setting and so on. Very, very skilled. Uh, they're masters at it, in fact. Left-hand side sort of shows one of the sort of tropical areas. It's about three years after the planting went in, and uh, a nice old ragged shipwreck in the foreground. Sandy beaches. A lot of the, much of the project was about getting the sort of you know this stuff right. You know the, what we call the mulches to create the the backdrop. Everything had to be instant because the park's meant to look like it's been here for 20 years. When we walk in here, five, so there you are. So we did the design drawings. This is a fleur de lis hedge, hedge maze for a French area of the park. That's a design drawing. Each cross represents a plant in a pot. And these were grown in a nursery in Germany called Brums. Um, and really, it just shows the, the transfer from the, the setting out drawing, so to speak, to the practicality of growing it, clipping it, and then getting it planted. So um, fantastic skill from the Germans, I think. Did anyone see Harry Enfield and that German guy the other night? Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, um, there you go. So <laughs> there, there, there it is. That's later than that, which I hope self-evident at least. Uh, yeah, and the sort of thing that, that would happen is that they would, they're business perspective artists who were, they call them imagineers, um, would, would draw something and it was a load of bloody square trees on stems with, with branches supporting them like Salvador Dali sketches. And so, um, because that was shown on, a pers on, on an artist's perspective, we had to actually make it happen. And fake trees aren't good enough, they have to be real. Um, so we were lucky enough to have a lot of contacts in general. Look at how good that rock work is, by the way. You know, a different, a different type of rock entirely. It's not on my chest at all. But brilliant, isn't it? I mean, much different from the other one we saw. But uh, superbly done. We were lucky enough to have a lot of contacts in Germany, and I actually knew a nursery that had got these sort of things kind of half, halfway to that stage. They were sort of bushy and kind of a bit oval-shaped. But we had about 18 months to get them boxed up and squared up and trimmed, and we actually managed to get them really looking pretty much like the artist's perspective at the time of planting. Um, I think this is in the first year of planting, and that's during planting. And these are Trachycarpus palms, which we brought in from France. They're all tied up and wrapped up to protect them from the frost during, you know, before the park opened. Um, but this is actually, a Mor the foreground is Morocco, in fact. So you, you wouldn't tell that from there. Um, the entry forecourt was one of the first things we did, and um, this is about four years after planting. Although, to be honest, it looked pretty um, mature when it, went, when it was um, first opened. The rhododendrons in the right, those bright coloured things for people what don't know rhododendrons, they, they, um, that was typical of the challenge because they hate alkaline soil and in fact they die in it very quickly. Um, so we had to treat the soil wherever we knew where calcifuges, which is plants that what don't like calcium, um, are to go, we had to treat the soil. So we actually had to plan the amelioration of the soil well in advance of the planting. So it's quite an interesting exercise in coordination. The one thing that Disney didn't want was the park to look French. When we first started working on it, we really thought, we, we actually themed up some balls that showed all this French stuff. And they didn't want that at all. So it's, this is a kind of, it's got an elegance about it. It uses things like tulip trees and um, magnolias, deciduous magnolias, and trees that you don't often find out in the streets. 
um, really chosen for their grace of form and uh, uh, maturity. Just a couple more shots, uh, sort, of the, sort of the edge of Colorado on the left, another type of red rock creeping in there, and the entry for court again on, on the right. This is a little amphitheater area on the left using uh, round-headed um, ravinias, which are false, false acacias. I always remember when I was a lad working for a tree surgeon, this guy said to me, Here, Clive, what's that tree called a fornicator? And I said, fornicator? Yeah, fornicator. I said, that's fornicator. And I thought, you don't mean falsicator, do you, Lloyd? Because that was his name. And that's actually what it was. So it's a fornicator. There we are. There's a fornicator. And there's the boat going around the lake on Disney. Everyone can go on a ride. Anyone that wants to know about lining lakes, there's lots of lakes and things that are going to come up and different techniques of doing it. I'll have a go at answering any questions you've got um, or any technical aspect. Feel free to interrupt. Disney do all their lakes in concrete, which is very expensive, but they do it because they have rails to guide boats and all these sort of hidden, wondrous things that they have to incorporate, which is very difficult to do with other forms of liner. We actually um, found some marvelous trees. I mean, the, these trees, on these multi-stemmed ones, are a, a tree called an amelanchia, which I think are amongst the most beautiful trees um, that you can buy. And the multi-stemmed effect was particularly um, attractive and very unusual. You very rarely see um, particularly a newly planted scheme with trees of that character and quality. Fantastic white flowers in the spring and fantastic autumn colour. That's the kangaroo on the left. <laughs> that means we're moving to Australia just briefly. Um, when I, when I um, qualified from college, the first thing I did was get out of this country for a while and I went down to Australia. And I was lucky, I'm, I'm a very keen angler and I like water courses and rivers. And I was lucky enough to stumble across the redevelopment of a whole river valley in South Australia called the River Torrens Linear Park. Um, the government of South Australia had put out a competition to a number of um, landscape architectural practices to overcome a very serious problem I got in Adelaide, which was the fact that the River Torrens, when it flooded, flooded badly. And about 15 years ago, it flooded Adelaide and it did 100 million pounds worth of damage. And if you index link that, or whatever the description is, that becomes a phenomenal amount of damage. Um, so they wanted to um, make this river floodproof. But Adelaide, if anyone knows it, is a beautiful city, but it's sort of just sitting in the middle of nowhere, really. It's not like Sydney on a wonderful harbour. Um, it's just there. And I think the government wanted to create s something special for the town. And they made the decision to make this huge linear park as part of a flood defence scheme. And that's really the background. The main thing is the flood defence, but it's trying to make the most of... Um, and this is what we did. That's Lewisham. I go by that river on the right every morning. And that's too often what people do to rivers to make them flood proof. That's, that's in my opinion, an ecological and landscape disaster. It also makes me angry when you hear the water authorities saying, well, you know, there's a water shortage. Well, of course there's a king water shortage if you shoot it all out to the sea at a rate of knots that nature didn't intend. There's no, no opportunity for that water to percolate into the water table. There's no opportunity for it to stay back in pools to, to actually create habitats. Um, it's just getting rid of water as quickly as we can to overcome the responsibilities of flooding. It's not the way to do things. And that thing on the left is like a lot of engineers like to do their outfalls into river systems. Again, they don't have to be like that to be functional. These are two separate areas, one urban area um, uh, of the River Torrens. This, this is a Hallex brickwork. This is an old brickwork here. Um, and a very urban sprawl here. The river in a very contained, narrow channel. And, and encroachment of industry right up to the river valley. This is a much more rural area. These are actually, um, this is a lemon grove, the rest are orange groves. Um, residential area, this is the suburbs really, but a much more rural part of the valley. And some very attractive rock outcrops and features that we could capitalize on. So that are just a couple of aerial photographs to show the sort of variety of situations we have to contend with. The right-hand drawing um, happened long before I, I actually arrived in Adelaide. 
the company actually had its own cost, in fact, because they hadn't won a job at that time, went down the whole river system and spoke to all the residents whose properties abutted the river and asked them what, they, what facilities they thought they would like in the valley, whether it was tennis courts. There were one or two things that were fixed. One was there was going to be a cycleway that you could use from the mountains to the sea with only minimum contact with roads. There are one or two places where the logistics of overcoming that were so great. There are one or two small areas where you actually use a road for a short system. But there are other things like sports ovals, tennis courts, pools, nature reserve areas, and that sort of thing that were the result of um, consultation with the locals. That area there, in fact, if you look, is that area there. So that section, this is detailed drawing. This, draw this drawing is actually, it, it looks quite simple, but it's in fact quite a sophisticated drawing. Um, because it's based on a very detailed levels drawing. So what we were in fact supplied with by the, um, the water authority was cross-sectional requirements at 100 metre intervals down the whole river, which gave us, there's a, ter a, a term called cumex, it's cubic metres per second. How many cumex of water you needed to pass through that valley to stop it flooding? Um, and that, by knowing that those cumex, we were told the cross-sectional area we had to achieve in order to accommodate the water. We also knew by the, by the um, soffit levels of bridges how, how high the water could be allowed to be, because obviously we didn't want it sweeping over the bridges. So for instance, we'd have to widen the channel to let the water pass underneath the bridge at a, at a lower level um, in some cases. We were also able to do some nice things like keep islands with dead gum trees, which the parrots and, and cockatoos and that love to nest in. This actual area's got a levee bank right around here. You can't, there are contours on this drawing, um, but you can't see them from where you are. And there's a levee bank down here as well, which means this whole area would um, flood as a giant pond in a hundred year situation, and then as, as, as the um, water subsides, um, so the problem would go away. Nice little tricks in, in sort of river engineering uh, is to keep the form of the river. We strove to keep the actual natural shape of the river. But to prevent erosion in a big flood, this will be a very, the river flows from right to left, by the way. This will be a very, an area subject to erosion. So we created these little reserve islands. And in fact, there's a little bypass channel through there. So when a flood occurs, that bend wouldn't be used. The water would actually come and flow through and circumnavigate the bend just make the land a little bit higher at each end, so it's kind of got a lip at each end. So it's um, a dry valley for most of the time, but when we get into a flood situation, that's where most of the water would go. Valley was heavily infested with European plants, which are lovely in Europe, but no good for wildlife in Australia. And very much part of the, the scheme was to reinstate um, all the beautiful but, but underrated plants that exist in Australia. Most Australians actually want European plants in their gardens, which is almost where there's some education due, because there's some beautiful plants out there and they're right for the place. Now, this is what the local brewery did to their bit of the river. Lovely. There it is. And that right-hand part really shows what the majority of the river valley was like. Very steep, a lot of it mined for sand and stuff and lots of fly tipping and rubbish, and that's really repeated here. On the left, you can see the first stages of the, the engineering works grading back the banks to increase the cross-sectional area. And then progressively on the right and on the left, the works, um, this is actually one of these, this will be one of these little side streams I mentioned here. Um, the works, the basic bulk earthworks being undertaken. Amazing, really. I mean, I can't really believe this was true, but if, if when we did our cross-sectional calculations we found there was a building or a tar breaker's yard or something that prevented us, something like that perhaps, from achieving the cross-sectional area we required, and there was no option but to buy it and get rid of it, that's exactly what they did. They bought up properties and relocated them, which is phenomenal for me. I came from England and I thought that was marvellous. I thought that's what it was like everywhere in Australia, but it was probably a unique um, a unique system. How they plant trees there, I mean, you'll see the sort of tree, well, you've seen the sort of tree planting we did in Disney, and I've got some, some shots of trees being prepared and lifted out the ground, which please ask me questions about planting big trees if you want to. But because of the, the 
arid climate in, in Australia. It's not really the norm to do that, in a, uh, particularly in a scheme of this nature. And they devise these sort of augers that just create a hole and al almost like a little um, lip around it. This is designed as a little mini water catchment area. They put this mulch material in and just small local native plants. The metal spike was a very brutal way of stopping the man with the mowing machine from mowing the plant because it would have mucked up his mower. But that's very Australian, isn't it? <laughs> and that's what the valley look, looked like seven years later with the grading done. I mean, the, the rate of growth on the trees, obviously one or two were existing trees that were retained, but all of these are new trees. And this is native um, vegetation and branching. Um, is actually what the scheme looked like seven years ago. And I, it's, it was very gratifying to go back there and, uh, and get punctures in my blown bike's tires and then walk along it. Um, 26, 26 kilometers. That unfortunately is life, isn't it? This was an information thing about the park, but you know, there is vandalism going on, so it's not all rosy. But I think the general feeling of, of the valley is, is very nice. And in the comfort that those people in those houses won't ever get flooded, which I think is an important element. Again, dead trees that were kept um, for the for parrots and kookaburras and other birds that would inhabit them. Contaminated sites. Um, this is uh, Bell Green in Sydenham, which is an old gas works site. And if you could read the background papers of the contamination in gas works sites, you just would not believe it things with sinister names like Blue Billy, because you go blue if you come in contact with it, and uh, all sorts of arsenics and oils and obnoxious substances, um, which frankly, if you, do if you do try and put trees into, they're very unlikely to survive. Um, also, um, you have to, this was, this was actually a retail store, a food store, so you can imagine the sensitivity of placing a, a food store over a heavily contaminated site. I actually saw it on one of these um, a minute to complain sort of slots that you get on TV and there's this woman saying, how safe is our food? You know, this site is contaminated. Um, the contamination on this site was really overcome by the installation of the, what's called a capillary break over the entire site. Um, the capillary break was a, a 300 mil depth of flint, in fact, and there's some stockpiles ready for spreading. Um, but it meant, in order to separate our trees from all this contamination, we had to actually separate them physically from the filth around them. And we did that by dropping in um, sewer rings and then lining them with a monoflex liner um, and um, then putting in decent topsoil. There's also a watering facility for putting water in and measuring how much is in there and then taking it out if we get into a flooding condition. Because, in fact, we've got a giant pot plant there. The lid you saw is the lids you saw earlier. I'll probably get this the wrong way around. Let's have a go. Are to go over um, this part here, so you can build your curbs and you get your metal tree drill in. So it's a bit of a structural, um, bit of a structural thing. And this is the first line of trees going in, leading up to um, the store. It looks more like a stadium. Do people know Chetwood Associates in Clerkenwell? Not far from here quite imaginative sort of retail, um, pre predominantly retail designers. Um, but they've got quite an interesting landscape and you get quite a lot of work with them. And this was a, so these are square headed lime trees. Actually when they're in leaf they look quite square. And they're about five meters tall I guess at the time of planting. You can see the liners and the protection going in there. The right hand bit is just, you know, the more general area of the store, just nearing completion and ready for planting ready for planting, ready for selling goods, it's finished. Um, quite this little job, or quite big job, got a lot of publicity. This is the Ready Mix Concrete's headquarters near Thorpe Park, um, a, a, list, a grade one listed building um, in the green belt that we, um, we undertook a public inquiry for. And we actually succeeded in, in gaining quite an unusual consent for a large extension to this listed building in the green belt by making it a very green building. This was Edward, Edward Cullerin was the architect. And the right is the after. This is, this is the, exit, the, the listed building that you saw. The new office developments are all beneath these roof gardens here. I think it's one of the biggest roof gardens um, in Europe. If not the biggest, it's one of the biggest. You can see there 
the new glass buildings with the roof gardens on the top. Um, they're pretty big. I mean, I don't know what they are in terms of acreage, but each one will be like two football pitches, you know, each one of these. They're quite extensive pieces of land. Um, and very, very well received by the people that actually work there. I mean, typical view of the whole thing here. And establishing, you know, young hedging going in. Not quite the Disney effect, you know, that not everyone has the sort of money that Disney actually has. I mean, to give you a measure, I think Disney probably spent about something like 14 to 16 million pounds on the soft landscaping of that park. That's big money. Have I gone backwards? I have again. Momentary lapse, you see. Water rills, quite nice, I think. Use of water, very narrow channels, nice granites and um, hard materials. Almost a nautical feel, I think, when you're up on the roof gardens. Um, very, very attractive. This is a. I knew someone was going to ask me that. I, I think now I, I may be slightly wrong here because I, I, I actually just did the planting design. So <coughs> we had to do it quickly. Um, it was what's called an upside down roof, and I think it was about a 300 mil concrete deck with two layers of asphalt um, on it, then a layer of polystyrene. And then the paving units were supported by um, like little pads. This polystyrene is a very high compressional rate, you know, it could take a lot of weight. Where we had soil over it, we had um, about 50 millimeters of leaker, which is light expanded clay aggregate. It's the stuff you go, you go into an internal scheme, you see plants going out of these little brown balls. It's, it's a drainage layer with, with drainage uh, system built into it, fully irrigated too, because roof gardens dry out. So that was actually for Kevin Underwood, who actually really dealt with the construction of the project. Very important, getting all your perforations into the structural work, so all your irrigation pipes could go through and your outlet pipes and all that. Um, it's very difficult to explain to people how complex what appears to be a simple landscape scheme often is. What's under the ground is often belies the simplicity of what you see above, um, if it's done properly. This is a job that I've, I used to have more hair when I started on it, but um, this is the Sun Life Center in Bristol, um, working with Skidmore Owens Merrill, um, who are based in Barclay Street. Um, fantastic people to work with, get on very well with them. And they have a real understanding of how to involve landscape architects in projects, which actually Americans do understand more than most English um, architects, to be frank. And we actually went to site and agreed where the building was going to go to subdivide the site, because all this is car parking. This is the essential stuff. You know, you've got to have it. But let's, if you're going to have it, let's have it in one place and then make the rest of it something special. In fact, this park, all of this is quite special. And that's all the, what we call the utility stuff. Um, and we focus the building on the old church of Stoke Gifford, because we stood in front of this. This field actually slopes seven metres of a constant fall across here. And, and about here, there's Bristol Parkway Railway here, and the old church of Stoke Gifford behind. And it's the only building in the whole landscape of any historical note, or the only, whole building in the landscape of any character. And that kind of persuaded the orientation of the building to focus um, onto that. As your architect, shall I run you just through the building function a little bit? There's a rotunda, which is the big meetings place, and it's probably inside it's most wonderful if you do get the chance to go and have a look at it it does nothing it's just a statement with a huge sun uh, mosaic on the floor and it's kind of got a, a cathedral like quality with gold uh, gold leaf in the roof and uh, a nice roof light and shafts of light coming in and s suspended stairways it's absolutely wonderful and you've then got the street which is which is an interior street which is this thing here and that's a giant space for milling. It, it was meant to be a very, it's democratic, the right word, but a, a, a building where everyone mixed and everyone has a similar sort of um, office facility. And the street was meant to be a meeting place, a place where you can shop. There are shops in there, post office and things like that. And an interior planting scheme, which we did, which looked very nice. Beautiful floor done with a, a limestone from Spain, polished limestone and granite. Very, very nice. These are the modules where the people work. And in fact, two modules here and four modules there. This is phase two that's not yet been built. Okay, so 
that's, that's not there yet. In fact, that's far more realistic than that. And these are sort of construction. Um, these are the terraces that overcame the seven metre change in level, because obviously lakes are flat, well, they drain away. So we had to step down seven metres or thereabouts and create the level plane of the lake for the building to. The idea is the building would reflect in the lake. And it looks fantastic at night. So this is the formation of the terraces to, to get down to the lake. And this is, uh, this is another form of lake construction, beware of polyethylene liners, particularly when you're in a design-build situation. And AMEC design and build tell you you can only have one that's 0.5 of a millimetre thick. When really, if you're going to use polyethylene, you should use something at least 1.2 millimetres, and even that will leak. So I think we're going to find that we do experience um, a leaking lake. The lake's 10,000 square metres, so it'd be quite disruptive to have to drain it down and, and do a lot of repairs. This is just a big roundabout just within the site. That road will take you down to the um, service yard. The car parking's off to the right and the building will be rising out of ground somewhere here a little later. We weren't allowed to design a, a bridge for the scheme because the money simply wouldn't allow it, so we bought an off-the-peg one, and I hated it when it went it in, when it went in. I, I actually chose a bridge and modified it, and then I hated it. But now it's weathered down. It looks, I think it looks great. It looked horrible when it was that red Iroko. And it's gone silver now, and it'll go more and more silver, and it really has blended in quite nicely. That's the island, which is the, the feature of, of the design. We had the furniture specially made by a wonderful couple, um, Alison and Rod Wales, um, who are at the end there. They make very beautiful um, contemporary furniture for interiors and exteriors, and we had specially designed litter bins made for the site. They actually sit on a I think they're on these timber poles. So all the furniture married together. And this furniture is the same wood as the bridge, so when it weathers down, um, it will all adopt that same silver character. It's the same company who did the furniture of Canary Wharf, where I think they made the big mistake of varnishing it to keep it shiny and red, um, when I, I actually think it looks much better once it's bleached and, and gone silver. And that's sort of the you know, picnic benches that were put around the park then, but with a bit of a difference, a bit of elegance. That is Herr Fluger. He is a German man. He's a fantastic man. He's a tree agent, lovely bloke. I've worked with him for years. Um, and we were able to, I believe, select some of the most beautiful trees and very unusual trees for the park room, the, the Sun Life Center. The brief was to create a mature setting for the enjoyment of the 2000 staff. And we decided not to do an ecological thing because it didn't really quite ring true. We want the building's very modern, very elegant, so we decided we'd try and choose trees that had a, an elegance that reflected the building. So we chose a lot of multi-stem plants with beautiful shaped crowns, leaf flower with big white flowers in the spring. It's actually a dogwood. You, you just can't buy this stuff in England, unfortunately, but we bought about 20 of those for the scheme. One of my favorite plants, in fact. This is a, a, a tree called a Nissa, which I've never heard of, but I actually, I was going round with the client who came out with me to Germany, and he just saw these, there was three of them standing in the field, and he said, I want one of those, because in the autumn when he saw them, it was, this all goes an apricot, yellow, it's fantastic foliage, and uh, lovely trees. So this is the bit that you spend your money on with a tree. I mean, the trees, good trees cost a lot of money because of the amount of preparation that goes into preparing the roots. In a nursery in Germany, a tree of that age, which is probably a, a 17, 18 year old tree, would have been transplanted five times. It would have been lifted and moved, which is a, 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 time, a time consuming task. Um, and also a lot of machinery, expensive machinery involved and skilled men. This tree is actually being trimmed to the root. This is a different tree, actually. I, I will not try and hood hoodwink you, lest you should be smart. But this is just to show the Hessian wrap that goes around the root ball. That is actually left on the tree when it's planted, um, as it is biodegradable. It goes within about a week of it being planted. You should never see how tiny the roots are that have been cut there. There's no big roots being cut on that tree, none at all. And if you wash the soil off that root ball there, it will be like a coconut mat. All the growing roots have been, by being transplanted, 
have been condensed into a much smaller root ball. It was really the, the natural size of the root ball of that tree would be something like that. And so if you actually took that tree out of the field and cut the roots to that extent, you'd cut nearly all the roots away and it would never survive. So you're paying for, um, you're paying for the time spent in preparing the tree. These are bigger ones, of course. That's my client, that's John Ireland. Capital Encounters with Project Managers, that's David Crump. And we had a wonderful time in Germany. Um, and it was so nice to have a client and a project manager genuinely interested, um, not only in a nice trip to Germany, but genuinely interested in, in what, they was, what was happening on their site. And this is actually one of those dogwoods being planted actually on the site. Um, so there's a sort of bit of a sequential thing happening there. Trees, the cost of trees. Um, if, I, if I go back to Disney, I can give you a range. Those, those square-headed trees were the most expensive trees um, that I've ever bought. The reason they were expensive was they were very, very slow growing. Um, and they were yew trees, which you know, the, the archers' bows were made out of. And they're very slow growing, um, and as a consequence, to get them that big, they've been somewhere a long time. And the extra work going into the crown actually made the big ones about fifteen thousand pounds each, which is frightening. Um, you can then go to um, something. Get this right, I hope. Something like these big square-headed limes. You can probably understand I quite like trees that are being clipped square and stuff for certain certain effects. These would dep depends. You know, to be honest, it depends on how much money I've got because I'll phone up the nursery and say, "Look, I want twenty, and I've got so much." I always know. Take liberties, but they will normally accommodate me. But you'd have to be—you'd have to be expecting to pay two thousand, two and a half thousand pounds for one of those. And then something like that, which is probably about four and a half meters tall, but quite a nice specimen, will probably be about eight hundred pounds. And then you get down to the the, the, the Nissa tree. Sorry, I've gone the wrong way again. Um, this sort of size tree here would be about five hundred pounds. Trees are actually sold by girth, so it's the, circu the is it circumference. Yes, it's the circumference of the stem. That would have a circumference of about thirty centimeters, as would that. That tree would have been about six or seven hundred pounds, but then a cherry like that would have been about two hundred and fifty. Depends on the type. And also in England, we've now we've badgered a nursery for a long time because. Um, I mean, we love going to Germany because that's so brilliant and the choice is so fantastic. But we don't go there because we hate English people and we've been encouraging English nurseries to, to start growing trees. Because the, the problem we have is we normally need 100 of one type or 200. And you go to an English nursery and they've got three lovely ones in one corner and four in another, but you can't make an avenue or a row. Or, um, but we've actually now got a company in Bedford who's, who's starting to do things the German way. And there you'll buy trees like that now for 250 pounds. And you can still buy good trees for 150 to 200. So it's all, I mean, a lot of the cost, honestly, is in, in transporting them. Because those big, um, these big boys here, you can only get two on a, on a trailer. Um, you can pack in smaller trees as well. But there's transport costs as well, which these weigh two or three tons, I think, as well. Big old boys. And they have to be, that's actually them planted there, as it happens. The other square-headed lines. This is a little viewing platform. This is something I actually got the nurseries doing, which is pollarded willows. Y these weren't commercially available, but for Disney, we needed. We had a Dutch area with windmills and like with canals, and I thought you've got to have pollarded willows, haven't you? And Herr Fluber said, "Yes, I have lots of windbreak here. We could cut some out, and maybe we could make it happen." And I in true German style, instead of doing the twelve I wanted for Disney, they did a hundred. And so I knew that I've got lines of these beautiful pollards from their, their shelter belts. And willows actually, you can get away with quite a bit with their roots, so bloody resilient trees. But these are one of my favorite things, these pollarded willows, 60, 70 centimeter girth there. And you plant them at a slight angle, never vertical, because the, you know, they always grow on stream edges with a slight angle, and they, they look fantastic. They would range from 850 pounds to 1,500 pounds, that sort of tree. And ev every two years, we take them right back down to just that stump there. And then, you know, within one year, they'll be back to that, and two years, back to that. I think they're wonderful. I love them. 
And he sell, Von Ehrens and Ernst and Hampers just can't sell them enough that they've sort of gone into mass production because people go there and we want those. This is a terrace thing you saw all in soil and rubbish, um, now with the turf down and the, the reconstituted stone copings. The recon stone was designed to match the building, so it's exactly the same specification. And what I wanted to do was make the landscape tie into the building, so it looked like the materials of the building extended out and the building was actually anchored into the landscape. Um, we used some nice green slate from Cumbria um, to get some of the detailing. This is literally before the project's complete, so there are, there are rails between these bollards here and chains between these now. So this is sort of, I haven't actually, because of the timing of the work, got photographs of the scheme finished. This is it getting close to, to completion. What am I doing time-wise? How am I doing time-wise? Am I going too slow or fast? Tell me. I don't know. <laughs> You're doing very slow. I, don't, I know if I go on too long, people start sleeping. Big pine trees in the lake, um, the terraces. Oh, there we are. And this is it, sort of um, just nearing completion now, the parkland area with the island. Um, the terracing here is actually over there, as you can see, and all the car parkings behind the building. Ultra Mac footpath, very nice material if you want um, to have footpaths so that look like spray gravel that don't melt in the sun actually gravel bound with a clear resin. I've just done that, haven't I? Let's go try again. This is the campus um, for, this again was working with SOM, this is the campus for the new Dartford, uh, sorry for any polytechnic at Dartford. I'm very much hoping that this gets built because we put a lot of time into this with SOM. It's a 136 acre site. Joyce Green Hospital, if anyone knows the Dartford area, is in this segment here. The M25 is over on that window, and the Dartford River crossing is somewhere up above that right bit. No, the Dartford River crossing is quite close. This is all marshland. Um, an old, this is an old derelict hospital site, and there's a quarry and stuff here. Um, and this sort of thing went through public inquiry. We've actually done the design. This is the master plan for the site. It's very well worked out. All these lakes, we've actually done the detailed grading plans for because we had to work out the cut and fill on the site to make the sports pitches here. We're filling the marshlands to make the sports pitches, cutting the lakes. This is a nature reserve here. There are quite rare birds down on the marshes, barn owls, even some bitterns and things like that. So we've got a huge it's very difficult to explain the scale of this. There's huge refed re systems in this shallow lake here. This is a natural lake cut into the water table. This is an earth dam. This is an artificial lake. And there's about a quarter of a mile of canal, which will have boats on it. So it's kind of the old punting thing. You can get in your little punt and punt your way around the campus. These are the actual, um, what's it called, faculty buildings. Um, this is the residential area, student accommodation. These are called incubator units because this is going to become a science park. And the idea is that you, once you get something off the ground here, you can then rent these incubators. So the other way around, once you get an idea, a scientific idea fired up in these little units, which you can rent for a good rate, you can hopefully then move into the park and establish a business. So there's quite a nice synergy between the business, the science park, the university, and what happens beyond which is the business park. So there's probably a logical transgression between the two. This is Jessica, who refused to speak tonight, I'm told. But this was a fun thing. Um, this is a small um, garden. We've, we've, for the last four or five years, worked for a, a charity called Action Research. And we've designed gardens for them three in, in the sort of Chelsea Flower Show and um, what's the one out? Hampton Court. <coughs> this is Hampton Court. Um, we always try and do something different, and, and, and I actually am a photographer as well. And it's on these days that I actually end up photographing Brit Eklund and people like that. And I have the unfortunate thing of photographing Brit Eklund with, um, who's that a photographer with the grey hair? Lord Litchfield, isn't he? Can you imagine photographing Litchfield? He's such a pompous guy and knows a lot about photography, so he's always telling you what you're doing wrong. But the way it's a Caribbean garden was the idea of this, so nice blues, um, we built an old with a nice rusty roof and we found a boat in Hastings 
and that's my partner's little daughter Jessica. It's another Jessica named after the other one, in fact. Um, but this is that is lovely, the old shipwreck and the old um, cabin being built. And there's another another view of it with palm trees. Obviously, the, they, nothing has to survive. You see, that's a beauty because it's all torn down, which in a way is a shame. But these plants wouldn't survive. In, it, it's not like Disney where everything will survive. There are bananas and and, and palms and things here. Um, and there are some buried tre treasure. There's all sorts of games going on here. We have some fabulous African dancers in their costumes. Wonderful, wonderful few days. And it raises a lot of money for a charity. This is a business park for Arlington. This is at Oxford. I just put this in because it shows quite a large water feature that we constructed. Um, and if anyone wants to know, you know anything technical about those things, I'll, again, I'll have a go at answering um, those things. One of the things that are... I just given this list. We've got we're working in 25 countries at the moment, which amazes me. And, and, and I just run through a few of them, like Bahrain, Dubai, Egypt, Ethiopia, France, Greece, Japan. We've got the first government commission ever for a foreign consultant in Japan. We built a park there now. Lebanon, Nigeria, Malaysia. A whole list of things. It absolutely amazed me when this list came through. Turkey, and we're just doing the Bolshoi Ballet in Russia, which is one of the newest projects we've got. A park in front of it, which. Uh, I think it's being financed by the Mercedes car company who wants to set up in Russia. God knows why. Couldn't be cheap labor, could it? No. Um, they want to set up in, in Russia, and I think it's kind of what we call planning gain. They're trying to offer something to the Russian government, and it is creating this park in front of the Bol Bolshoi. Um, but I've got one in backwards. I knew I would. Anyway, we always do image boards for clients because, quite, quite honestly, they don't really... You know, landscape architects are funny bird regardless, aren't we? They don't know what we do. Um, so we, if we get a, a project, we'll try and give our client a taste of the sort of things we're going to create for him. This is in, in Cairo. This is a large villa project for some very wealthy brothers. Personally not involved in it, but I thought I'd just slot it in um, to show you the sort of bit of a cross-section of the work we do, sort of classic foreign work, I guess. We always get nice perspectives done also to give the, the clients a taste of, um, of what they may, what they're hopefully going to achieve. Again, another perspective on the right and a working drawing, a hard landscape working drawing, putting backwards. <coughs> Pass on quickly and you'll never know. That's the buildings under construction. To be honest, they didn't bring us in quite early enough because the buildings could have been better located, uh, a bit up front, and they could have been set back into the, the whole park a little bit better. But I think we'll, we, we actually, it actually has come out quite well. It's pretty much complete, this project, and a sort of typical detail of uh, classic sort of paving. We had to use local materials. It was a brief from the, um, from the client that all materials had to be Egyptian. We couldn't have any imported material. And these are some of the, there, this is one extreme to the other, from Von Ehrens in Hamburg, where, you know, and this is the, the local nursery, and he's a man. It's a wonderful cross-section of people you come into contact with. It's just so interesting. And these sort of guys that just shin up palm trees. This, this is just protective um, raffia to protect the tree in transit. But uh, marvelous people that you come in, you know, you come into contact with in these situations. And I usually got the most appalling nurseries. You know, it's just incredible to go and see them. Um, quite monolithic sort of step details. You know, one or two piece units. Um, nice solid bits of construction um, and it's obviously the formal palm trees going in before the pavings are complete. And these are little sample areas again using local materials that we just do a little sample panel for approval of the, um, of the clients um, to see if that's just right for them and then we carry on and, and, and finish it off. Very nice detailing I think. Kevin's very, very, Kevin Underwood is very good at this um, this stuff. He's a, we call him Trad Kev, which is traditional Kev. He likes traditional stuff. Again, another detail. This is grass being grown for the project. And they grow grass like a little hair transplant. They don't just seed it or turf it. They actually grow hundreds of little grass, s grass seeds and tubes and then plant them. Because labor's so cheap out there, it doesn't matter to anyone. They, this person will plant grass all day for a next door to nothing. So they, they do it that way. If you I don't know if I particularly agree with it, but it, it is a fact of life. It's so cheap to do it. That's how they do it. Unbelievable. 
I think we're getting close now. The beers are coming closer. When you've got an out of season project, you can, if as long as you know, in time, you can always get trees planted any time of year. You, you're not any more dictated by the seasons. This tree was designed, a number of these were planted that large to try and hide this monstrosity. This is a contaminated site again in Enfield for Sainsbury's, Jay Sainsbury's, part of their car park for their store. This tree was lifted from a German nursery and containerized in a nursery in Kent in a proper container. It has to be insulated. It's in a specially designed um, wire cage with collapsible sides. And that is the extent of root growth. That tree has burst out of that Hessian stuff you saw earlier. It, I mean, in five or six months, this is September, so it had April, May, June, July, August, September, six months. And it's like spaghetti junction, isn't it? Like, it's like spaghetti. The roots are just spread to the edge of the container. And that tree will not be under any, any stress when it's planted, as long as it's watered and, and not, um, not ignored. But, uh, and that was it, really. I saw some fireworks at the end, and I just, I did have some lichen, sh some shots of natural stones with lichens on it. I was going to put a sort of little release between the different projects. But when Shani told me there's going to be two carousels, it just blew my mind. So I'll just show you a few lichen shots to end, because these are going to be between these, so you can have a few lichen shots um, to show how wonderful micro nature is. And. Uh, just the last one, and that's that's it. And any anyone who um, any questions you like, then I'll have a go. You know, I can't uh, can't promise to be know all the answers, but. Um, sh shall I? Oh. Shall I repeat it? Because I've got the benefit of technology here. The question was, was there any special water provision um, created for the pollarded willows? Um, the answer to that was no. And, and to be honest, trees that actually live near water, like willows and alders, don't necessarily like it. They tolerate it. It's a, they are adapted to tolerate. Um, and they were actually grown in a, in a dry place in Hamburg. So they, they had grown their whole life in a dry situation. So they actually went into a similar, just well-prepared, um, dry situation. The whole park, though, has watering points throughout it. Um, I think as summers get drier, we're going to be moving more and more into irrigating schemes, to be honest. But on this particular scheme, we've got watering points so that you're never more than a 20-meter hose length away from any part of the park. So if you like, it's a 40-meter <coughs> diameter before you come up against another watering so you cover the whole thing. Um, the biggest killer of trees, if a tree is going to die and you've bought a good one, 99% of the time it's going to water logging. Too much water is what normally kills trees. And, and they're killed by kindness. You get this well-meaning person dumped gallons of water on them every day and it literally drowns the root system. Or the ground isn't properly prepared and it's compacted. There's not. Um, there could be, and it would be nice if there was, but that the membrane liner normally has sand underneath it to protect it from um, sharp objects like flints or pieces of stone. It then has a, um, what's it called, uh, like a terran, do you know terran? Um, a geotextile. Um, it's like, it, visually, it's like glass, soft glass fibre. Layer over it that acts as a second layer of protection. Then the, um, the geotextile, sorry, the, the polyethylene liner goes down and the edges are normally protected with a gravel which has, a, has another geotextile beneath it. But to be honest, um, to use a 0.5 millimeter thick liner on the lake of that size was stupid. And we told AMEC time and time again. It was a project that um, many, there's so many different ways projects are set up nowadays. It was a design and build project where we did the design drawings and naming the materials and the patterns and the depth and size of the lake. But there are elements that we were instructed by the client and the quantity surveyor, who's next door, Gardner and Theobald. Because they were nervous of the, um, no one knew how much the whole thing was going to cost, there had to be some common sense prevailing. We weren't allowed to actually specify the liner. 
we, spe we did a performance spec that said it must be watertight, da 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 da. And because AMEC, I believe, underbid, it, uh, underbid on the job by quite a few million, they were trying to save money everywhere they could. And I believe, foolishly, they installed a very thin liner that will give them problems in the future. Um, it should have been a clay liner because um, water com th that lake would be half full in normal circumstances. In the winter, it would almost be completely full, so there is groundwater beneath it pushing up. And we, on our design drawings, we actually showed a clay liner because the weight of the clay would help offset that um, pressure. Um, so we will wait and see. It's going to be quite interesting what happens. Water features are very, very difficult, but they're very beautiful. Um, Can I ask you something more about the feet? Yeah. Um, Well, you see, you've got to get your contract value up to get your percentage fee right. No, that, no, um, how would I, how could I say such a thing? No, I mean, I mean, I, uh, funnily enough, this morning, I've just come back from a scheme in, in Bromley where we've, we've brought a guy down from the Mullock in Tyre because he's one of the few guys that can professionally layer hedges. And we're doing exactly what you say, all native planting, small, small stock derived from a nursery, in Kent, it's going to be wonderful. But we've got a client there who is a, who, who's very interested in his land. He wants this traditional English setting, um, and we do acres of the sort of planting you're talking about. It just looks—it's not interesting to do a slideshow about it because it doesn't look much. Um, but rest assured, a lot of what you've said is going on, and I've just chosen projects here because they are more visually interesting. Where the brief was an instant landscape. My greatest interest is ecology, and that's what I'm best at. Another very interesting project I'm working at, um, and I've just come <coughs> back from a meeting, is, is a new health, or, or not a new, uh, uh, an improvement to an existing health spa um, down near Liphook in Hampshire, um, where I'm working very closely. I actually was on site with four ecologists, which was fascinating. And we're actually talking about extending sites of special scientific interest into the land under our client's ownership and reinstating the native heathland and managing all these different things. It's very interesting. It's just not the sort of thing, it, it's probably the most interesting aspect of our work, but it doesn't make a good slideshow. Well, it's not the um, slide, though, well you know, the thing is that Heather's, Heather's normally um, created best by spreading cuttings around the ground. It just doesn't make good... good Yeah. Yes, I mean that that was really I, I think probably probably exactly what was being discussed. It's a native scheme. The trees were planted very small, have grown very well. Um, the thing is with people like Disney, they, they open their park and it's gotta look as if it's been there for a long time. It's it's their way. They ain't got time to let that stuff grow. Um, and native you know, small plants do grow very well as long as you go through the normal processes of selection, care and aftercare. We've just been invited to look at a 200 acre deer park which will be along similar lines as well. We've got nature reserves built in rugby, um, again using totally native mixes. We've done lots of work and also on the university you saw the campus, although a lot of it will be big infrastructure planting, the reserve area will be thousands of native plants, reeds, rushes, alders, oaks, hedges, and so on, and wild flowers. Um, so I've given a kind of one-sided view. You know, there is the other side, for sure. And it's, it is the most interesting side. The 
the problem with that is, if, I, if I'm totally brutal, the soil scientists we work with would often come up with prescriptions, and they often have done, but the risk attached to it is too high in this commercial world. It's a very nice, um, it'd be a very nice kind of experimental project, if you can put it that way. Um, but when you've got a, a commercial client with a commercial operation like a superstore, um, it's got to it's got to work. You can't have people coming back at you forever. You've got to, you've got to do a belts and braces job on it. But there, there would be ways, I'm sure, of ameliorating the soil um, and actually making it happen. Well, there are ways of doing it. Yeah. actually just had an, a, an occurrence. Um, we, we, we were recently, about a year ago, commissioned to work on this earth centre in Doncaster, um, which is a millennium part, part millennium funded project. And the earth centre is, is um, intended to be um, a demonstration of sustainability in the future. It uses and, in, and, and harnesses systems of water, energy, wind, all the, the natural forces um, to create electricity and the other things that we all need to survive. It disposes of sewage in, a, in an ecologically friendly manner. On that particular site, which is an old slag heap, exactly the sort of experimental work you were talking about is being undertaken. And as part of the Earth Centre demonstration will be there, and even if it fails, that's part of the, the idea, because it will highlight to the visitors the problems of actually um, recovering contaminated land with pHs of three and a half or three um, or similar. With all, I mean, as I speak, I think of more and more examples. We've done a lot of reclamation work for British Industrial Sands up in Kings Lynn, which is lots of native planting in soils of, of you know, pure glass sand, pHs of three and a half, very acid stuff. So acid you're not allowed to swim in the lakes because it will burn your skin. And we've got acres of woodland planting established there. There are plants that actually fix um, nitrogen from the atmosphere, um, and uh, there are things like alders and, um, and, a, and a number of the heathland-type plants, um, broom, for instance. Anything that's like a pea, a pea-type plant, like a broom, ha has the ability of fixing atmospheric nitrogen. You, you can actually do an awful lot by using, using that. It's a very broad subject and very interesting. Um, God, we're going back to, uh, if you bear with me when it comes to me, I'll shout, because it was quite a long time ago um, that we did the work on them, probably 12 years ago, but I, with a bit of luck the names will come, <coughs> come to me. We did a huge play area, um, British Industrial Span Sands, I can't quite remember, but if I do remember I'll shout. I'll just say it like an eccentric, that's where it is. Should come to me. I, c I can't remember. Okay. Thank. Thank you very much, everyone.
get so familiar with the new things that he's interested in, it's the new things. You're always interested in the new things and the old things. But I like this one. Best project is the one. Best project I've ever worked on. And very enjoyed it. You know, going and chatting with my lovely Miss Davis. She was a nice she came back. Oh, well, she's still back. I know she's still back. <laughs> Particularly, I mean, like, does, does Frank do the piano bits? The Philomenes, Albers? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you get ages of things. Um, not all of them, but some do. I mean, the marine ones are, you know, but I mean, there's lots of Albers and Franks and still fresh water. In fact, they become a real problem. I mean, like, for instance, St. James's Park, which is shallow in water, it's just turned blue every year. It, it gets warm, and there it is. How long have you been here, Jessica Dinty? Look at our girl. Da -da. Jess, do you remember the work we did at British yeah, Industrial? Yeah, I know. Like, 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 um, there was a golf course there, and there was a golf club on the lake, and there was a yachting marina. Is Ballsy an area up there? B A W S C Y, Ballsy? Kingsland. It was Judy's work on British Industrial Sands, Michael Langley Smith and Judy. If you, if you give me, if you jot. It's very hard to put things on the outside. Yeah. Was it Ballsy? Lesia? Yes, it does. Lesia, right. Yes. It was Ballsy, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't know how it's looking, but it was vegetating well. But, but all the technical stuff about it, like how you can begin to find out what's happening. Now they're going to show it by doing it. Yeah. And it's a bit of a scary thing. Well, I mean, the sort of process we, we go through is we, we'd employ, for a job like that, an ecologist and a soil scientist. Right, so um, soil science can put one together and do Absolutely, yeah. You, you and people get that in their we, work. We'd go to a company um, and commission a series of boreholes get the full results back plus the recommendations for amelioration um, and that's that's where the root of it is getting the soil and also getting the right stuff in the soil you can't understand how to plant, you absolutely plant the if you're planting you into chalky soils you have a whole different spectrum of plants to plant inside and they do a lot of that stuff in Germany yeah, don't they? yeah but don't underestimate we do acres of it here too because that's what we've had And the Dutch are very good as well. The Dutch yeah. do acres. It takes of it. a part of it to realise what the difference is. Yeah. 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 Five of them are good ideas about what they should do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just so clear what the difference is. Which Absolutely. Is really quite yeah. 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 Absolutely not, no, and they really should. I mean, this, this thing, this thing I'm working down in um, Litbrook is fascinating, going around with the ecologists. And it, it's sort of, it's a Hampshire and Sussex border. Hampshire, I, I, it's just off the A3. Um, and it's, it's an old um, health spa that really is right high and high. It's really run down. And the, the, the client wants to rebuild it and make a fantastic spa. It's got all these SS sites of special scientific interest coming into it. 
And because of that, we agreed with the plan as a very specific management plan to extend and enhance the setting of the building. And uh, I think I think one one of the problems with landscape work is it's su got such a broad spectrum that giving one slideshow you're no, going to no, cover no, you can't you cover an aspect of it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think I think that our practice has moved into a lot of these commercial and foreign jobs to survive. Um, Literally, there is a reality, but there is also a lot of interest in, as I say, the Earth Centre, I think, is going to be a fascinating project, um, because we are going to tackle, well, it's going to be an agricultural area as well, you know, show that there's trees being used to do break, break wind, I suppose the expression is in English, <laughs> to break wind, harding trees, and, that, you know, using trees for functions, and coppicing and providing power, and then also... When we experiment with the, diff with the despoiled areas of the site, if an area fails, it's educational. So it's not just going to be a pretty glamorous thing. Yeah, yeah. Because that, as a landscape designer, you know, yeah. all sorts of things that you can do with it. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of experimental work done on the slag heaps up in the northwest by a guy called Gemmel planting the uh, leguminous plants that, that fix nitrogen. He, he had a lot of success in, in ex actually establishing trees on snag heaps, which are with all their problems, and wrote lots of papers. And Without no, capital? No, no, yeah, nothing at all. Just just um, a little bit of work, I think, in the tree pit, like putting some things in the actual hole you dig. Um, but the problems on these places are enormous. They run rivers of acid. You know, when you get up on them, there are rivers of acid flowing across them. It's extraordinary. But we've also got the thing to get there waiting for It's waiting. Yeah, it's been waiting. <laughs> We started Paul Troy Ballard. Yeah, Hi, Paul. Hi. Yeah. Right. There's salt within the, the substrata from yeah. trees hate salt for the most part. That's why when we design design trees in paved areas, we always put a curb, an upstand curb, because in the winter obviously we'll get salt put down and, and then the man with the broom sweeps it all into the tree pit. So we, we tend to always put trees in, in slightly raised areas so that doesn't happen. Um, there are trees and plants with a greater salt tolerance um, than others. Would there be Jess of book that had, had saline? I mean, this, the ones I'm aware of, I mean, you, you normally just look at what grows near the coast, actually. Um, and unfortunately, by definition, they tend to be a bit scruffy looking, sea buckthorns. And, but it, some of the pines, I think, would have a tolerance to salt. Um, but I think that mangrove Oh, yes, specialized, specialist trees. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, if, if there was a problem, I mean, with, um, it al it al it's always a problem. I mean, it, if only you knew those things were going to get maintained. And th I love the Italians, but they're terribly wavy, don't they? <laughs> and they wouldn't do what they said they would. They'd still take the money for doing it, but they wouldn't actually do it. Because you could actually isolate the tree pits from the salt um, and actually have clean soil that can establish your trees in. But if you give me a, I mean, I mean, there, there must be, there must be lists of salt, or the more salt-tolerant plants, mustn't there? They are limited, yeah. 
are very limited. Yeah. But you'd really be better, I think, to dig out the areas, so to dig out an oversized pit and perhaps line it with clay, but have a drainage, a, a facility to drain the bottom, put a layer of gravel in the bottom and puncture the bottom and, and, and uh, stop lateral. No, you don't see them. But there would be there would be means of devising simple details to ensure those trees remain healthy as far as saline ground conditions. So, and I, I do think that the temperate trees that would actually suit are a scruffy bunch. You know, I mean, physically quite, and not really probably what you'd want in a square or a canvas. Venice is as cold as here, isn't it? It's hot in the summer, but it's cold as here in the winter. So, um, but there's loads of trees that would survive the climatic situation. It's hundreds of them. It's the salt in the ground that would you'd have to do some special. And they, they well, the thing is with mangroves, they need this fluctuation as well. They're so refined. And sediment. We've got all the crabs now. All the, all the uh, mitten crabs from Japan are testing our rivers now. Are you from Japan? All your mitten crabs, have, you've got mitten crabs, and they've got, they've been in the bilges of boats from Japan, then they pumped the bilges out, these crabs have got into the River Thames, and are now going up all the tributaries. And they've, uh, five naughty crabs. They, you know, they're quite vigorous, and so they're becoming a little a bit of an ecological problem in, in, the ten, in, in the tributaries of the Thames. And literally, it's from bilges being pumped. The crabs are in the bilges of the boats when they come up the Thames, and in they go. It's amazing how stuff gets transported. But if you want to, if you want to talk about it further, um, if you want to give me a call, I don't have a card with me. But if you've got um, our number's 0171 828 6392. And you could pop over and see us, and we've got a lot of construction details that might help you. Yeah, so feel free if you would like to. Yeah, do. Feel free. And if you want to pop over and look at some details, we, we could probably even devise something. Some use to do. Okay, pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> 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 